So the question that I would like to discuss with you today is how does our body understand the digital world? Because for many people who interact with the digital world, it's really complicated. And when I've worked all day on the computer, I still have to go to the gym because I haven't done anything. And then when we look at the people on the bus or in the subway, it's almost an addiction. I don't think it's good the way it is like that. And I think part of the problem is that we, in interaction design, focus a lot on the head and not enough on the body. Too much on thinking and not enough on feeling and just doing. I think if we listened a bit more to the body, we could make the interaction more easy, more natural, and maybe even a little bit more relaxed. Think of swimming or riding a bicycle. Stuff that's actually complicated, but we can just do it because our body has understood it. Hence the question, how does our body understand the digital world? Now, sadly, we can't ask the body. However, I think if we listen closely, it's telling anyway. Because in everyday language, we use a lot of metaphors when we speak about the digital world. Let me give you some examples. When I say that I, I feel buried under email, you know what I mean. There's a lot of emails in my inbox, they've gotten on top of me, it's too much, I can't move, I can't breathe. It's just a metaphor, there's nothing burying me, but it describes the feeling. Or when I use the term data mining, it's perfectly clear. There's a lot of data, some good stuff in there, and it's pretty hard to get the good stuff out of there through mining, and it's pretty, it's like hard work. My favorite one is actually, my hard disk is not big enough. I know that my hard disk is a tiny box inside my computer, and when I say I want a bigger one, I don't want a bigger box, because that's not what we mean by it. But I think what's behind is that our body somehow understands information like a physical substance, because that is what it really knows, right? And it's also interesting when we speak about information consumption, like news or social media or reading, we use different metaphors that are related to that. For example, we speak of the information diet. We speak of eye candy for stuff that is nice but not necessary. We speak of food for thought. You see where I'm getting with this. And maybe that's hard to swallow, but somehow our body seems to understand information consumption like food consumption, like eating. Now, that is historically really interesting. Because when we look at how our eating culture has evolved, think of the 1990s fast food explosion. Ubiquitously available everywhere, kind of tempting, hmm, looks good. Then we like stuffed it in and didn't really think about it. Then after eating, oh, was that really good for me? Like second thoughts. And half an hour later, well, hungry again, all these second thoughts are gone. What happened then is like more selective approaches came up, like vegan eating, don't eat everything, or split up by ingredients, like carbohydrates, don't eat them in the evening, they'll make us fat. Or more aware approaches, like asking, okay, this food, where does it come from? What's in there, and what will it do to me? So maybe with information consumption, we are in the fast food age right now. It's ubiquitously available, we just take out the phone, it's kind of tempting, then we stuff it in, and then we may think, okay, was it really worth it? Was it really good? Hmm, maybe not. But then again, five minutes later, the hand goes back into the pocket, gets out the phone. And we want more, we're hungry again. Maybe also here we need more selective approaches, don't consume everything, or at least more aware approaches, like, okay, where does it come from, what's in it, and what will it do to me? Because today, our most limited resource is not any more time, it's attention. Now, the third metaphor I find really interesting, it's the most interesting one, I think, is how we speak about our devices. When we speak about our devices, we use a certain kind of metaphor in everyday language. For example, when my battery is running out, I say that my phone is almost dead, which sounds a bit like it was more alive before. And when the phones started to get more functions, we started calling them smartphones. Of course, the smartest thing on the planet is us, by far, and that's great. But we somehow call them smart as well, because that's how our body understands why it behaves in such an intelligent way. 
And I'm not sure about you, but sometimes I have the feeling that the relationship between my computer and me is at least disturbed. You know, when it crashes right before I wanted to save my work. And it has to do that on purpose. It's about the relation. It hates me, you know. And I think what's behind that is that our body understands devices like social beings, because that's what it knows. Fair enough. Now, this is actually a metaphor we took into a project. And in this project, we looked at body language. Body language is something we humans do really well. I can be like open, I can be oh, skeptical and a bit scared, and I don't have to think about that, and neither do you. We're just really good at it, we do it all the time. Now, technology is a bit different for that matter. My mobile phone, when I reach out to it, it just sits there, you know, it doesn't do anything. Technology is really bad at body language. Now, what if we built a mobile phone that, when I reached out to it, that could, like, through body language, react. Let me show you what that could look like. So, for example, when I haven't checked my phone for a while, it's happy to see me and comes towards me and, hey, and I've got some super exciting stuff for you. And we're really good in body language. So it's, it's no thinking about, oh, of course, it comes towards me, it's open. However, when I just checked my phone, you know, five minutes ago, maybe it's not super excited about me. It's like noticing, oh yeah, all right, you again, yeah. And maybe even sometimes we overdo it, you know? We check it again and again. Why can't the phone in this case just be annoyed a little bit? Like, oh, come on, not you again. Oh, yeah. So what we humans have around ourselves are different spheres, you know? There's a public sphere, there is a private sphere, and there's a very intimate sphere. And we don't let everyone get in there. So what if a phone had the same? Maybe then it would be skeptical at first, do not trust me like that, and then I have to go slowly and like, convince it that it can trust me, and then it would change its mind. So that raises questions, doesn't it? For example, it raises the question, do we want technology that has an opinion of us, that doesn't want to be used at any time, that maybe mirrors back some of our behavior overusing it, or do we want technology that like, does everything we say, executes every command, like sit and stay and stand, in this case? Well done, yeah. <laughs> the future. Okay. It also raises bigger questions. For example, what do we want the relationship of technology and people to be in the future? Do we want to meld the two together, or do we want to like, draw a clear line, human technology? Do we, and I'm a bit skeptical with this, do we want to continue understanding our lives like a software program, status update, status update, status update? Or do we want to start living moments again, without documenting them, but also without letting technology get in between? And thirdly, there are these moments, everybody knows them, of, of boredom, of weakness, and of solitude. What do we do about them right now? Well, we reach into the pocket, we kill these moments and escape into telecommunication. That's a bit uncomfortable, let me just check my email. It's like a micro-procrastination. We don't want to let this happen because it's uncomfortable. But if everything is telecommunication, where are we? What about the here and now? And maybe these uncomfortable moments of boredom, of weakness, and of solitude. Maybe they are also important for us, because that is when we spend time with ourselves, when we critically reflect, and thereby develop ourselves further. Now, there is a fourth metaphor lurking here. Humans are like computers. Always connected, never wrong. I don't think that's what we want to be. It's even my fear that, like in the future, we might turn, at least psychologically, turn into a kind of Darth Vader. You know, a mixed form of machine and human, unable to exist without the machine that's become part of us. I think it's really, really important that in the future, we do not turn into a computer, but stay human. Thank you. <laughs>